The name of our program is the MAPS Films Rights and Land Claim Certificate. Uh, we hold it annually every summer at the University of the Fraser Valley. Have been doing so since about 2008, if I remember correctly, perhaps 2009. Um, it's a condensed four-week course in which we have students in class and in the field for an intensive uh, four-day week, uh, four straight weeks. Um, at UFV, uh, in terms of academic credit, we qualify our certificate as the combination of three distinct but interrelated four-credit third-year courses. So students, by completing this program, end up with 12 upper-level credits that they can pretty much use for program or for elective purposes. Um, it has three courses, uh, one taught by uh, instructorship from geography, um, two of them taught by instructorship from history, from a disciplinary perspective. Um, and um, we consider it unique. Uh, we're not aware of it being offered or anything like it being offered anywhere else, uh, certainly in the province. My role is in some sense twofold. I instruct one of the three courses, uh, a geography course on the use of maps in the resolution and litigation of Aboriginal land claims in BC. Uh, but I also serve an administrative role as formerly Associate Dean in the Department of Geography um, and also more recently in HR. Um, I'm kind of the uh, person at UFV that kind of makes it go from an administrative perspective, uh, clearing it, of course, with curriculum committees, all those kinds of things that academics have to deal with. Um, and to get this offered in a unique way for um, what we think has been, and I'm sure Lisa will ask me, a life-changing experience for us as instructors and also for our students. And I think um, it was driven by a desire in the late 2000s uh, when we had the right constellation of personnel at UFV and um, a realization that there was a lot of misunderstanding out there, not just amongst the general public, but even in circles where you think folks would know better, uh, whether it be for paralegals or lawyers or teachers. Um, and of course, land claims being a huge issue for uh, contemporary British Columbia and has been for some time, uh, something that we could contribute. I, I, would, I would say in some sense, we wanted to do something in terms of reconciliation before reconciliation became a more fashionable term uh, in the latter few years. I think the impetus partly came from the initiative of the instructorship. Um, one of my colleagues, Hugh Brody, has had a distinguished career uh, going back to the early 1970s when really in some sense he pioneered the whole concept of at least representing and mapping an indigenous land claim with the um, Inuit land use and occupancy studies of the early 1970s. And then Hugh coming here as a Canada Research Chair in Aboriginal Studies probably I think in about 2007 for myself, I had just minted not too many years before a PhD that writ large was trying to take a serious look at the history of Aboriginal cartography uh, since first contact in British Columbia and through to the present day. And at that time, this would have been 2006 or seven, having just been called as an expert witness to testify in the Chilcotin title case um, when I did some of the uh, cartographic support for that litigation. Um, on top of that, uh, UFV was really starting to get serious about indigenization, and I mean in the general sense, both programmatically but also institutionally. So there was a, cons a constellation of sort of impulses that came together in the late uh, first decade of this century, um, and some encouragement, I would say, on the part of the um, uh, Office of the Provo, um, for us to bring our expertise together and come up with something that spoke to, in a unique way, uh, one of the very definite and distinct social, economic, political, and cultural challenges of our time, which is, in essence, what is it that land claims are? Where do they come from? Why are they important? Why are they only on our table now and not earlier? And why is it important that we find a way to resolve what has sometimes been called, in the history of this province, uh, the unsettled Indian land question. Mm -hmm. And we thought that something that looked directly at the resolution, the reconciliation, uh, the methodologies that one has to adopt when one decides to launch a land claim against Canada or the province, as whatever the case may be, 
uh, litigations that are seeking title and rights. Just a huge, uh, not necessarily misunderstanding, but just a, a general lack of knowledge out there in, I suppose, outside of a very narrow portion of the academic world about what exactly are these things. And we designed it as uh, something we thought we could deliver to students, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, cross-cultural. And um, I think in essence, that's sort of what drove us. It was kind of a, just a few, a series of lu uh, lucky events that came together at the right time and the willingness of the university to let this happen, that we were able to make it go. Hard to say, I don't think the original aim of the program has changed. The original aim was, as I've said, um, this is something people need to know about in all walks of life, uh, legal, academic, pedagogical, uh, cultural, um, coffee table, whatever the case may be. Um, and so I think if we've changed anything, it's perhaps been in our approach over the last nine or ten summers that we've done this. Because you learn when you're working with a mixed uh, student population, and you are dealing with culturally, um, politically sometimes, economically sensitive topics. Um, I think if anything's changed, it's the way we've approached the pedagogy in the classroom and in the field. The original objective that we think there's a story that needs to be told here that everybody needs to know a lot more about, uh, that hasn't changed. That still holds. Well, I think we measure the success of our program. Uh, we suffer from the same um, difficulties that universities in general have, which is tracking the success of their students after they leave the academy or after they leave a particular program. But we do know that we have placed students in very viable occupations. We have had students over the last nine years that have gone on to be paralegals, that have actually gone to law school with a view to taking uh, Aboriginal law. Uh, we have put students into the uh, Department of Indian Affairs and the specific claim branch. Uh, so we know that they've gotten government postings. Uh, we've had at least one student who started her own online web 2.0 GIS barefoot mapping um, consultancy service. Uh, so we, we get anecdotal feedback from students that we've uh, had in the past uh, and know that they're very successful. Beyond that, uh, we know from student feedback, both in terms of official evaluations, which we still have to do at a university level, but also anecdotally and in testimonials, or whatever the case may be, how much this, uh, these 16 days over these four weeks changed their lives. Uh, that taught them something about uh, things they knew they wanted to know more about, but had not previously had the right opportunity or vehicle to get at, because there's really nothing else out there that is focused so directly on land claims, where they come from, where are they going, why are they going where they're going, what does it mean for all of us? and in terms of, again, reconciliation more generally. Um, and students have told us that it has been a life-changing experience for them. Um, I suppose, uh, more selfishly perhaps, uh, we can tell from our student evaluations, our instructor evaluations, how much they enjoyed it. Um, it's the kind of material that often in class gets emotional because it is cultural. Um, you have students from all walks of life in our classes. Uh, some are wounded kids, needless to say, indigenous kids, uh, suffering the direct or generational effects of residential school. Um, personally, I was, maybe I wasn't in hindsight shocked, but many, many indigenous students at UFE having come through our program, um, yes, a lot of them from the lower Fraser Valley and many of them knowing almost nothing about uh, the circumstances, for example, something as fundamental as the creation of the Indian Reserve System. Where did that come from? Students just didn't know this. It didn't matter if, from what cultural perspective they came from. And to see the dialogue between, particularly, and I can't put it any other way, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students in these classes, in the field, and when I got them to do uh, uh, a mock uh, Aboriginal land use and occupancy study in one of my workshops, uh, just the focus they were bringing to this, the actual experience of being able to bring out a small piece, yes, but an image of what an indigenous life world looks like or feels like that they hadn't had the, op they never even imagined could have possibly existed. So 
we know it works because our enrollment has gone up every summer for the last four summers to the point where we turned a half a dozen students away. Last summer in 2018, we still took in 32, which is really treading soft, uh, treading dangerously on meeting your learning outcomes, which we say very clearly are in-depth participation, dialogue, uh, the willing to ask questions, the willing to be controversial, and to hear the voices of 32 students in a condensed day, when of course, as yes, as academics, we still have all this material we wanna give them. Um, but to see them respond and focus on that, and then when all that is said and done, to come out and have some of the successes they had, they've had since academic, academically uh, in real employment, uh, but just in general, people that have, when we see them in the hallway, um, still tell us how much this experience was to them personally, and we feel very good about that. Um, so we know it works, and um, it's also why it was so some reluctance we had to put it off for one year this year in 2019, but hopefully we'll be able to bring it back in 2020. And what that will give us is an opportunity to at least reboot this thing because we do have a little bit of updating to do. But how do you deliver something like this to many people? Mm -hmm. It's almost a contradiction to where you need to go in 21st century post-secondary pedagogy, which increasingly speaks to experiential learning, mm -hmm. uh, smaller classes, group work, um, hands-on applied research, those kinds of things. How do you get that in? Um, when in some sense the instructorship is quite specific and I should, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge Sonny McCalsey and Dave Sheppey at Stalo Nation who are the gentlemen that co-teach with Hugh and I and really take both of our areas of expertise, mine such as it is in Aboriginal cartography generally, Hugh's in filmmaking and representation, but also Dave's and Sonny's because they're in Stalo Nation, they work for Stalo Nation. Um, and they bring this very unique Stalo perspective to sort of the general thematic topics that our certificate is about. And of course, that's exceedingly important for us because UFV is very closely allied with and of course sits on the traditional unceded territory of the Stalo nation. Well, the curriculum was determined, as I think I've indicated, um, probably as much by expertise. Uh, I consider myself um, as a historical geographer, sometimes a cultural geographer. Um, but I've always felt, and obviously it's a little bit of bias there, that uh, land claims is fundamentally about geography. Um, and I was fascinated by maps even when I was a kid. Um, and so that interest in cartography and the ways in which it represents particular spaces or territories or worldviews um, we think or thought at the start was a missing piece of the geography programs writ large and post-secondary generally, um, never mind as it might relate to um, the Indian land question in British Columbia. Hugh Brody, of course, has been making films for many, many years, uh, Hunters and Bombers um, um, on Indian land, uh, more recently the Kwekwe piece on the Healing Center at Chehalis. Um, internationally well-known uh, scholar, uh, filmmaker, most recently largely responsible for the revitalization of the first uh, uh, indigenous land claim, if you will, in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, and of course, him being here, as I've said, at CRC chair. Uh, Dave Sheppey, I had known from earlier work uh, when I was doing my PhD back in the late 1990s. He was then senior archeologist at Stalo Nation. He's now got a bigger title than that, but basically um, is in charge of the Stalo Resource and Research Management Center and Sonny McCalsey, no introduction needed in my opinion, uh, a, a virtual encyclopedia of Halkamalem history and geography in Saltamakwa in the Lower Fraser Valley. And so obviously that expertise took us where we wanted to go, but I think at the end of the day, these are the things we think need to be addressed in any um, certificate or equivalent program that professes to want to teach or learn something about the history of Aboriginal land claims in British Columbia, where they're going and why they're going. And so much of that is not just about the practical realities and challenges that First Nations face when they essentially are being asked to go to court or wherever uh, to prove their existence as a people with an identity 
Um, in some sense, as I've been told many times by folks that I've worked with, why do we have to prove what we already know? That's the reality in the world of uh, legal discourse and Western worldviews that we live in. Um, and so much of this is not, in short, just about sort of the practicalities of executing a land claim. Do you have the resources? Can you get the research done to meet the, whatever the legal test happens to be in the flavor of the day in terms of the evolution of Aboriginal law in British Columbia? But it's not just about those real challenges, it's about how you represent and conduct that process. How do you film it? How do you document it? How do you map it? How do you, in fact, circulate it into public discourse more generally? Um, and what are the methods by which you do so? And one of the things, of course, we ask of our students is to start being very critical, for example, about what they see even on documentary television uh, about Indigenous lifeways and Indigenous land claims. Um, what about popular media? What does that say? What kind of messages do, that, do those things drive at the same time as you have uh, blockades as at Unistoten or the Dakota Pipeline Access. There's these two poles, um, sort of the romanticized vision of First Nations that sort of stems back to Dances with Wolves, counterpoised against the real realities of on-the-ground conflict. So how is it represented? How is it transmitted? And for us, um, maps is certainly part of that. That's right down geography's alley. And certainly representation is right down uh, Hughes Alley but the sort of the historical contextual stuff that wraps around that and makes this Stalo as much as anything else is the participation of Stalo Nation itself. They collaborate with us. We take the certificate out of the university and we put it into the Stalo Resource and Resource Management Center at Sardis. Um, so that we're doing it on um, Yes, we're still doing it on unceded Stalo territory, but at least we're doing it on Kopalitsa, which is Stalo Nation grounds. Um, so the curriculum, in short, was by us and from us and our interests. Um, but it also fits with the broader objectives in program development at UFE more generally. And we knew then, as we still do know, a decade later, i.e. in the late 2000s, that our Indigenous curriculum was wanting. Um, we didn't even have yet an Indigenous Studies major or minor. That only came later, maybe a few years after that. So as it's turned out, of course, the courses have fit in beautifully for upper level options for the Indigenous Studies major or minor, uh, but they're standalone courses on their own right. Um, and um, in some sense, I think we started to fill in a few of the missing pieces for a, a more robust post-secondary Indigenous curriculum um, that kind of in some sense almost wrapped itself around those. And so, in short, uh, the curriculum was driven by where UFE was going and its various state of strategic plans vis-a-vis -vis indigenization, but something that could tap into the expertise of the people that were here on deck when they wanted to go that direction. And obviously we would bring to the table what we thought we were somewhat qualified to speak of. Um, and uh, that's what drove the curriculum. And I would say that, um, and I want to say this, um, we've done a lot of second guessing, of course, in terms of the fact that we are teaching, yes, in some sense, indigenous material. Uh, the majority of us are not uh, indigenous instructors. Um, we've always felt uh, Hugh, Dave, Sonny, and I, and I think I speak for all of them, that it isn't the messenger so much as that matters than the message. Does what we offer students from academic and sometimes non-academic backgrounds, uh, does it offer them an explanation, a vision? Uh, does it hang together? In other words, do the, do the four courses, which we deliver on alternating days uh, deliberately, do they hang together through those 16 days? Does what I have to say about the use of cartography in the dispossession of Indigenous peoples as much as it can be used for the repossession process by Indigenous peoples, um, uh, does that matter? Um, and does it work with what Hugh has to say about other kinds of representation in film and documentation, these multiple narratives going on at the same time? I've never forgotten when I was doing my PhD, uh, the headline after the 
uh, first edition of the BC Treaty Commission's 1994 First Nations Land Claims in British Columbia under the new rules of the BCTC. And I'll never forget the headline in the Vancouver province. I forget what month it was in 2000, and, sorry, 1994. Have you seen the new map put out by First Nations in BC? They want, geez, 110% of the province. And that call from the sort of general public has stuck with me for the better part of the last 20 plus years. Um, no, it's not 110%, but when you start mapping indigenous territorialities, when you start representing it, you realize, you know, overlap is part of what makes an indigenous world different than the Western. How do those two perspectives talk to each other at a treaty table, in court, by what means do they do that dialogue or undertake it? Um, we try to be clear uh, and nonpartisan in terms of uh, we're not advocates necessarily for the treaty process on the one hand or in favor of just outright litigation on the other. We do uh, give our expertise as uh, uh, to our students that these are serious choices you always, always have to make, but we try to remain completely nonpartisan. Uh, we do try to walk a somewhat delicate line um, that sometimes touches on emotionally charged topics. It's pretty difficult to talk about land claims without talking about residential schools, and we quite frankly have many Indigenous students that have been there, done that. Um, so I want to—I just wanted to make make the point that I think we're reflective enough as instructors and as a university um, to find the right space. In other words. Um, and by all means, disagree with us as you like. I think at the end of the day, Lisa, what we've always looked for, and I spoke to this earlier in terms of feedback from students, did at the end of that 16 days have an impact? Did it hang together? Did it make sense? Did the, did the case present itself kind of as a prima facie reality a check on where we've been as a province, uh, where we've been as a colonizing power? And... Um, we don't pretend for a minute that, um, I mean, decolonization is difficult. It's difficult for people that otherwise profess to know that they have to decolonize. It's still tough to do. Um, and I'm always reminded also 140 years of colonization might take seven generations to completely decolonize. And we do tell our students at the end of the 16 days, and this is the message we repeat all through this thing, is that, um, Yes, the academic piece is part of it. You gotta get the grades, to get the credits and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the 16 days, does this uh, change the way you think? And we get so many students who are so charged up by the end of this thing. I wanna do something now to build on this momentum. And we tell them, if all you ever do for the rest of your life is just change the mindset of one person, you have done that. You've become an ally. You're part of the broader movement for peace and justice and reconciliation. Uh, that really is at the heart of everything we've tried to do um, in the certificate. It kind of grew very quickly over the first two editions. We always envisioned it as having more, I'll say for starters, more of a field experience. Um, we haven't had as much of that as we would have liked, and I can give you reasons for that. Uh, for the first couple of editions, we also had some fascinating guest visitors. Um, uh, a couple of gentlemen, in fact, who were directly involved in the Gitsan Delgamuk trial um, uh, came to visit us in our first year, um, and uh, something similar happened in the second year. We found, though, very quickly that to try to squeeze in all the material and get students involved, especially the bigger the classes got, uh, time became really precious. and. Um, we did manage to develop my, I, we, as I said earlier, we devoted an entire day of one of my four or five classes over the 16 days to an in-house land use and occupancy mapping project that just gets students to actually do this from the oral history right on up in class. Would we have liked to take students out into the field and do some GPS positioning and maybe a little bit of filming? I, obviously we would, but it logistically, and then we, we squeeze in, of course, the now almost world famous uh, joint UFV Stahl place names tour that Sunny delivers every year. Uh, we just ran out of time. So um, the pedagogical process increasingly became much, again, 
in contradiction to what we say about post-secondary education in the 21st century, um, a little bit more conventional in terms of in-class, but very conversational. Uh, we, of course, in each class, which we, again, alternate, it'll be me one day, Hugh the next day, maybe Dave and Sonny the day after that, maybe a field trip the next day. So there's a good rotation and students don't get sick of us in a hurry. Um, so we wanted to have this rotational pedagogy um, because that helps, of course, uh, to have the material from these three separate courses kind of hang together in a more interlinked manner as you go from one day to the next. Uh, yes, we would have liked to uh, retain a bit more in-house stuff, uh, something we're going to consider when we reboot for 2020. Um, but we wanted the classes to the extent that we had to have them to be conversational, dialogical. Uh, there is no final exam in this certificate. We only ever ask students to do four things, show up, participate, be active being one of them, um, participate in the in-class workshop on land use and occupancy mapping being the second one, um, do for us at the end of the 16 days a 20-minute presentation on any topic of your choice that learned or charged you from this certificate material, which in some sense has always been the most rewarding for us as instructors because we get 25 of these things over a two-day stretch, and some of them are outstanding. Um, and what we ask for in, on top of that is a major project which essentially revolves around what we like to call it an analytical self-study because we haven't figured out what else to call it. It's not a diary, it's not a journal, but we ask students after all is said and done after the 16 days, take off for a month, think about this stuff and write us a report on your journey through the certificate, where you started, why you started, why you wanted to get in, what you learned from the certificate, maybe what you thought you might learn but didn't learn, the kinds of questions you came away with, and in that final project, show us some ability to think between the courses, think against the grain, how, do that, how does that material hang together? And so we think um, four pieces. Uh, one, a written analytical self-study, which is the majority of the grade, such as that uh, is relevant, which it is, of course, and the rest of it split between the oral presentation and just being there and participating and being being a part of the group. Um, and so in some sense, in 16 days, that month, yes, after we're finished and you've got to write that analytical self-study, it's a lot of work. Um, and because all of this certificate comes at you in 16 days, plus an additional four weeks to think about it, um, um, it is a lot of work, but when you think about how much work you would have to do to get 12 credits across three separate 13 week courses at the upper level, it's a pretty good deal and uh, it works. And it's, I'm happy to say it's exactly what UFE thinks it needs more of, uh, special topic, condensed cohort based, uh, nonlinear timelines because students of course work different kinds of hours these days. Um, so pedagogically also, yes, driven by where we say as a university we're going in terms of 21st century learning, experiential thinking across boundaries, global citizenship, participation, all those things, but still doing all of this through courses that yes, do have a very and sometimes intense academic focus. Um, so an organic pedagogical process that we have adjusted on the fly as we've gone. We'll continue to do so. And if I do have one serious want, it is to make it even more experiential, more in the field uh, than it has been previously. Indigenous perspectives, of course, and I, I did touch on this in terms of the instructorship uh, of the four of us. Uh, oh, Sunny is, of course, in Clackamuck, uh, Indigenous. Uh, neither Dave, Hugh, or I are. Um, and so again, it does cause us to consider uh, the question that is still out there in circles, uh, by what dint or authority do non-Indigenous have to speak for or with or on behalf of um, Indigenous peoples and their concerns. And I think I've already addressed in general, um, we think that's a non-starter in terms of a counter. Um, what matters at the end of the day is does what is offered make sense? Does it hang together? Does it, is, it a, is it an argument or a, a statement or a case that, that, that seems intuitively to uh, uh, be justifiable on the evidence? Um, 
Indigenous perspectives, of course, are a huge part more of Sonny's and Dave's course because uh, Sonny takes them out and into Saltamaqua, into the Lower Fraser Valley, and uh, gives them a, a geographic tour from a from a Halkamelan perspective with his place name tour. Um, we use Indigenous research methods. I think I've spoken a little bit about that. Dialogical, conversational. Um, we have no final exams. We have no midterms, which are totally Western forms of uh, assessment, uh, to, to say the least. Um, we find that in offering a significant portion of the grade in terms of an end of 16 day, uh, 15 to 20 minute PowerPoint presentation of your choice, uh, we've had performative presentations, uh, student performance musically. Uh, how does how does Indigenous music relate to the resolution of it, uh, uh, Indigenous land claims, for example? So students get an opportunity to do all kinds of performative um, activities, for lack of a better term, as part of their assessment. Um, obviously, our authorship, uh, to the extent that we go to outside sources, uh, a lot of Indigenous authorship, uh, both from a theoretical and research method standpoint, also from a content st standpoint. Um, it's true that um, those of us in, in sort of Western culture cannot ever fully understand an Indigenous perspective. Um, and also, of course, we get representation of those perspectives from the students in our classes themselves who speak up and often speak up bravely, boldly, emotionally. Um, and at the end of the day, they tell us that uh, they very much appreciated the way in which the class generally and the instructorship in particular was able to be accommodating, was able to um, have people's voices heard, if sometimes controversially. Um, and that was both often support or critical. Uh, that's all part of it. Um, so we do the best we can and actually, for me, perspective is really what it all comes down to. Uh, really, what this certificate is about is perspective. It, it's about, in essence, it's about the resolution and the reconciliation of two quite different worlds and two quite different worldviews that came into collision on the Northwest Coast specifically, earlier elsewhere, um, and has brought us to this place. Um, so. I think it's something that needs multiple perspectives. It needs perspectives from both the Indigenous side and from the non-Indigenous side, because ultimately what land claims are about is about the negotiation of a space between two quite different um, worldviews. One that has recorded its history in documentary fashion by lines on maps and um, in written texts and in legal discourse, and one that has hung on to that legacy orally, uh, through memory, uh, by the oldest form of uh, knowledge transmission we still know, um, and for lack of a better term, uh, storytelling. Um, and anything that helps us in the certificate tell a story may be the best way to put a point on this. Okay, uh, my name is Naka Katsi, uh, new sacred strength inside, also known as uh, Albert Sonny McKelsey, I'm the historian and culture advisor for the Stala Research and Resource Management Center. Uh, it's through that uh, job and experience that I uh, bring some expertise, I guess, to, to the course, which is called uh, Indigenous Maps, Films, um, Rights and Land Claims. Uh, it's uh, actually a certificate that is offered by the University of the Fraser Valley. Uh, my role is one of uh, four instructors uh, the other instructors, uh, one is a geography, geography um, professor, uh, the other one is a, a filmmaker, and then one of my co-workers who's involved with, uh, with the treaty, and then myself as the historian and uh, culture advisor. Okay, what the program is about, um, looking at the, the history, mainly in BC, uh, looking at uh, the history of uh, what's called, referred to as land claims, uh, also included in there, um, you look at the uh, treaty and uh, rights, those sort of things. But uh, you'll notice the first part of it talks about maps and films, okay? So uh, it's all about uh, land claims and treaty, and the history of that, how, how the land was uh, acquired by the provincial government and 
now and then now looking at ways that uh, we as First Nations uh, throughout BC using maps, using films, and using other other means like negotiations and, and such things as that uh, to get our land back, you know, and the different uh, um, different opportunities that are out there, I guess, are different programs like the specific claims and the treaty, BC treaty process, uh, treaty negotiations, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's pretty well uh, for adults mainly, post-secondary uh, students because it's operating through uh, UFV, so I imagine most of the people are all post-secondary that attend. Uh, yeah, the age group, doesn't matter. Uh, a whole wide range of, uh, of ages. Well, I think one of the main things is to teach people about the history of uh, how the Canadian and provincial government had acquired our land without, uh, without signing a treaty, even though it is uh, part of their law, part of their requirements that they're supposed to sign a treaty, they're supposed to purchase the land off us, but, um, uh, and, but the BC is one of the only places in Canada where there's no treaties. Right? So how do they get the land then if they sign treaties you know, east of us? So there's a big history there, uh, you know, a lot of racist policy and a lot of other things like that as to um, uh, conflict of interest, things like that, you know, as to how they acquired uh, acquired the land. Mm -hmm. And but in our eyes, we as Stala people, we view it as uh, it's unceded. We still maintain our Aboriginal rights entitled to what we call um, soft myth. And uh, part of the aim as well, uh, as my involvement with it, is to show the, what aspects of our culture, what aspects of our history. Uh, in terms of our health claim language, what are those things that uh, show that relationship uh, to our land? So I want people to understand in the end that uh, it is within our culture and our history that we did own this land. You know, we still do own this land. We still maintain our Aboriginal uh, rights and title to this land. It's a unique Aboriginal rights and title uh, where we have um, aspects of our culture such as Swokwam and Squelquel and Shuli, which is basically the creation stories, the history stories, and then our Shuli meaning uh, spirit or life force that we share with ourselves and also everything else that's around us, like the mountains, the trees, the ground, the grass, everything has a Shuli and we have that connection through that, through that Shuli. And then also we have obligations to take care of things uh, expressed by our chiefs, as uh, meaning this is our land, we have to take care of everything that uh, belongs to us. Mm -hmm. So as part of uh, my contribution to the class, I take them out on a tour, a seven hour tour, uh, from uh, Chilliwack here all the way up to, to Yale. So mainly the upper bird part of the uh, Stalo territory. Uh, share with them anywhere from 100 to 120 place names talk about the various aspects of our culture and history, including the Swakmiam, Squakwal, Shuli, talk about the different beings that inhabit our land, uh, talk about the place names, whether or not it uh, has to do with resource activity or, uh, or just a geographical place name that's used as we, in the past, used to travel up and down to the river. Uh, the river was our main uh, transportation corridor, so a lot of the places were used as a means of understanding where you're at, or it says a place name that uh, shows the importance of the area in terms of the resources that are available there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's my, that's my main contribution is what I just uh, just shared. Uh, but the other contributions, of course, there's uh, Ken Greeley, whose background is geography, and but not only in, as an instructor, but also he works uh, with First Nations throughout uh, BC, uh, helping them with their maps, okay? One of the things that we find is maps become really important as a way of documenting uh, the traditional use activities of our people, documenting the fishing grounds, the hunting areas, those sort of things, and also documenting uh, place names, uh, archeological sites, those sort of things. So, that's what Ken really does, and I think he takes them through an exercise so that they can learn, you know, if they're interviewing someone, how do you take that information from, from a, a knowledge keeper, for, from a resource user, and apply that on, onto a map, mm -hmm. you know, and also the importance of WOW is that 
because of the fact that um, we're going to court, we're going to treaty negotiations, all these different things that we do, uh, it has to be done in a manner uh, that is legal, that will be legally uh, recognized as well. So there's certain uh, certain process that you have to do when you're doing that. Uh, the other part of it is through film. Okay, so Hugh Brody, uh, well-recognized uh, filmmaker, uh, not only just working with Indigenous people here in Canada, but also in uh, other other areas of the world, including uh, Africa. Uh, some work with the Inuit. And, um, and understanding, you know, the, the, the problems that uh, Indigenous people go through with, uh, you know, their, their land being claimed. Uh, and then also looking at, uh, he's able to um, film their culture or their activities and as a way of using that to show through film, you know, the connections that uh, people have and the importance that they, that they maintain for, the, for the, their, their land and their uh, resources. And then the next one will be uh, Dave Shappi, Dr. Dave Shappi. He's the, uh, uh, the director for the Stala Research and Resource Management Center. And also he's the head archaeologist. His background is in archaeology. Uh, so he started working for us here at the Stala with, uh, with, the back, with his archaeology. But over the course of the years, uh, he's been become more involved in many aspects of of our uh, culture and history, you know, especially with the uh, with the books that we've uh, we've written, like the Atlas, uh, Stala Coast Salish Historical Atlas. He played a big role in the uh, book about Tifalatsa, and also a big role in the book about the Talfeyak tribe called Bean Talfeyak. Mm -hmm. And I think the most uh, experience that he brings is that he's also the technical technical advisor. Okay, for the treaty negotiating team. So when we look at the makeup of the treaty negotiating team for the Stahl for Freemont uh, Treaty Association, of course we have our political advisor, we have our legal advisor, myself as a cultural advisor, and then Dave Sheffy is the uh, technical advisor. Mm -hmm. So basically he's the one that does the reports, does the, takes care of the finances, uh, and provides all the, you know, coordinates the different committees, uh, Anything that's needed by the chiefs or the Stahl Hukumuk uh, Treaty Association uh, that's needed, you know, some of the different uh, funding that we get, uh, he has a, uh, he's involved with that. So he brings that experience uh, to, uh, to the program. There definitely is a difference. It, does, it is making a difference uh, because one of the things that we make sure that we do we at the beginning, uh, we go through an introduction. Uh, everyone has an opportunity to speak as to why they're in the program, what uh, you know, what their objectives are, what they hope to learn, and uh, sometimes they, it's very short, like what they're what they're saying. You know, sometimes you wonder, are they just here for the marks? You know, or, or what, what is it? Do they really have an interest in in the uh, First Nations uh, culture and history? Do they have an interest in the whole uh, treaty process and land claims process? Uh, but in the end. Uh, some of the comments that the students have is that the, they change their whole perspective. They don't realize, um, you know, what the government had done to us, you know, all the different ways that they've undermined our rights and titles of the land. They don't realize, you know, that there was the anti-Potlatch law that we weren't allowed to vote until uh, 1962. You know, the Potlatch law ran until 1951. We weren't allowed to hire uh, lawyers, we were allowed to gather more than six people on the street. You know, those sort of things. They didn't realize that that was there. That woman could lose their status by marrying a non-native person, but women without status would gain status by marrying a native person, right? So all these uh, inequalities that are a part of the uh, uh, provincial and uh, uh, federal government, mm -hmm. right? So in the end, I think uh, they have a better understanding of that, and of course, there's a lot of misconceptions that are out there where people say, you know, all our schooling is free, all our housing is free, you know, we don't pay taxes, all those sort of things, right? And so we know that those uh, misconceptions are out there. So, as part of the program, we address that and let them know, you know, what the real story is. You know, a lot of us do pay taxes, you know, <laughs> and there's a bunch of things that uh, they just uh, had uh, different ideas about in, in, at the end of the program. It really opened their eyes, and a lot of them, like my contribution with the um, place name tour, 
uh, a lot of them said they're going to now look at the land differently and never going to look at it the same because of the, the different names that we have, uh, the different things that are out there on our land. Yeah. Mainly through my involvement, uh, Dave Sheppey as well, because of his involvement working with Estalla for many years, all the way over a decade now he's been working with us. Uh, and so he's acquired uh, quite a bit of knowledge uh, because of the, heading up some of the different uh, research initiatives and also going out and, and, uh, and interviewing uh, elders. Uh, so he's got quite a bit of knowledge of that, so he's able to present some of that. Uh, but the other main perspective, I guess, is from myself, because uh, I am a Stalo person. And uh, as the historian and culture advisor over the past uh, 33 years, uh, interviewing elders, uh, mainly for understanding place names, but at the same time, uh, the chiefs, when I was first hired, one of the things they understood is that um, fluent, healthy and speaking elders have a different world perspective. They view the world still in a style perspective, whereas those of us, including myself, who was raised with English as a first language, although my father spoke Lakatmachtin, my mother spoke Halkmelem, they, but they couldn't talk to each other, so English was the household language. But I was introduced to each of the languages, but not to the point where I could become fluent and could, could uh, speak it. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, over the years, then interviewing the elders, finding out these different uh, uh, different pers uh, different perspective that we have when we view the land, mm -hmm. like the real eye opener, I think for me was the term I uh, mentioned earlier. So, in 1988, only been working for three years when the late Tilly Gutierrez of Chautal told us that when the chiefs used to, used to meet and talk about the land question. They started off with that statement, and they used to meet up in Yale, so it's an important meeting ground up there. Mm -hmm. And she brought me right to the place, showed me the rocks, she's able to tell me where so-and-so sat, all the different chiefs sat, showed me where my great-grandfather, Dennis Peters, where he used to sit. And she said that at the beginning of the meeting, they all started off with that statement. So, this is our land, we have to take care of what belongs to us. So I remember when she first mentioned that, and you know, just been working for three years, you know, all these things were in my mind were, what are the chiefs talking about? You know, yeah, this is our land. You know, the first statement has to do with our Aboriginal rights and title. We own this land, it is ours. But it also says we have to take care of everything that belongs to us. So in my, my mind was, what are they talking about? So over the course of the years, interviewing the, the elders, that was always at the back of my mind trying to get it, get at it, what is it that they're talking about? Mm -hmm. And so with the tours that I do, and with the, when I take the students on the tour, all the different elements, the important elements, like talk about the place name, talk about the meaning, and quite often just by getting the meaning, you don't understand what the name is about, right? Because like the example I always use is the name for hope, is calls, means bear or bald. And I tell you that, and now you're going to wonder, oh, well, why do they call it Bear Ball? Right? And then, of course, you need to know the geography of the land. You need to know that the river runs north to south and turns west there. You need to understand that as you move from Vancouver up to Hope, the mountains narrow, like a funnel effect. So there's a steady wind that's constantly blowing in the town of Hope. Doesn't, it blows so strong, it doesn't allow the branches to grow on one side of the tree. So if you go into Hope and you look in the tops of the trees, you're going to notice it's a call, Bear Ball on one side of the tree, right? So the significance of the name is important as well, because quite often you get the meaning, all the meaning does is add another question is, well, why do you call it that, right? So that's part of the, part of the, uh, the training or um, sharing that, uh, that meaning and that significance uh, with them. And then looking at the different elements to me that are important out there. So not only with the place names, but elements of our, of our culture and history including the two main aspects of our oral history, the Shokam and the Squawko. And I already mentioned they talk about the Shuli. Also, they have different beings that we inhabit our lands, like different uh, Stlalakan. We have uh, uh, the Salmuth, the underwater people. Um, we have the Mimistiyuth, the little people that inhabit the, the forests. And, and so I talk about those at different stops and talk about the importance of those and how we take care of them, how they, how we, how they take care of us. 
talk about the different ceremonies we have, like the burnings that we do in the spring and the fall, mm -hmm. talk about the origin of the Schweikwe mask, talk about how it's the only mask that's left today, talk about how uh, a little bit about the winter dance and spirit power, those sort of things, so almost all the elements. So the stuff that when the chief said, we have to take care of everything that belongs to us, one of my objectives is so that people have a better understanding of what belongs to us and why do we have to take care of it, mm -hmm. right? And to hopefully through those stories about uh, you know that are out there on the land, uh, that they have a better understanding of that. It's important because uh, one of the things is because we continue to be an oral oral uh, culture, and you know so I shared the two main aspects the shokbam and the squawkal, you know, other ones are like the word for scolding, like scolding is another way that you, you pass down uh, teachings. Uh, and, you know, we continue to do, our gatherings are done where we still call witnesses, you know, everything's done orally mm -hmm. as well, right? Uh, but one of the things is to maintain the integrity of our oral history, we have to tell things uh, the way they're told to us. Like, uh, and Frank Malley, Sanchez from Yucopias, uh, he's the one that talks about that. You can look, see that in the book, um, You're Asked to Witness. And that's what he explains, is that if you're told someone by an elder, you have to tell it the same way. Okay, you can't, you can't make the story uh, more exciting or, or change it, you know, to make it, make it more exciting. You have to tell it the exact same way, right? And then by, tell, by doing that, um, not only are you letting the, your audience know that this isn't some idea that you just made up or came up with, uh, and you offer the name. So, so when I just talked about the importance of that, I just oral footnoted Frank Malloway as my source. He's the one that told us the importance of telling the stories the way it's told, right? And so, but the other thing too is uh, we have a protocol where we are not allowed to uh, mention names of deceased people certain times of the day, mostly at night. Um, the elders say, like Rosalie and George and uh, uh, Elizabeth Herling saying that uh, if you say their name, it's almost like you're calling their spirit. And you, can, you should only call them when you have something for them. And that's when we have ceremonies where we have things for them, that's when we call them. But the rest of the time, we should just let them rest. Don't, don't, uh, don't be calling them. But one of the things is, is that uh, since I started this job in 1985, working with probably about 100 elders, I think, over the years, and they're all gone now. Uh, so um, when I oral footnote, when I mention the names, their names of deceased people, my feeling is that it's like I'm calling them to, beside, to be beside me, their spirit to be beside me, to watch over what I'm saying, to make sure that I say it the way that they said it, right? So maintaining the integrity of that oral history by mentioning their name. So that's my, my view of it as well. Mm -hmm.